here's a proof of concept. Yes, this is viable. We'll use the bucket model like this. And actually, we already delegate this over here and it quacks like it should. So it's going to work. And, and, then, and then I put that back into my pitch. And now like I've passed the velvet rope test and I've passed the concrete test. And I like this velvet rope test being in there. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, is it a uh, real thing? Or did we just make this it, up on the fly? That's how these things happen, man. You know, I like everything it. comes out of conversation. I love it. You know, that's right. Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode cloud servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Linode makes cloud computing simple, affordable, and accessible. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing your enterprise's infrastructure, Linode has the pricing, support, and scale you need to take your ideas to the next level. We trust Linode because they keep it fast and they keep it simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. What's up? Welcome back, everyone. This is the Change Local Podcast featuring the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators in the world of software. I'm Adam Stachowiak, Editor-in-Chief here at ChangeLog. On today's show, we're revisiting ShapeUp and product development thoughts with Ryan Singer, head of product strategy at Basecamp. Last August, we talked with Ryan when he first launched the book ShapeUp, and now we're back to see how ShapeUp is shaping up. How are teams using the wisdom in this book to actually ship work that matters? How to shape up work in new versus existing products? And we also talk about the concept of longitudinal thinking and the way it's impacting what Ryan designs. And we also cover a grab bag of topics in the last segment, so make sure you stick around. Not even a year later, but uh, Shape Up is out there. So how is Shape Up shaping up, Ryan? I've been pretty blown away by the results, actually. Uh, I keep hearing emails dripping in from folks uh, talking about, hey, we just finished our third cycle or we just finished our fourth cycle. You know, mm. and these are six-week cycles. So this is like, it's a, it means they've, they've done some reps. They've really learned some stuff. And we're seeing some amazing results. I was, I was on a phone call. Uh, I sat in on a conference call with a Fortune 50 company that adopted ShapeUp on their digital teams recently. Wow. And the amount of like i don't know what to call it emotional energy is very surprising i mean you know you talk about something like product development and it can be very functional you know like did we get the stuff done on time and was the quality what it should be and stuff like that but the amount of excitement that people have about like we're collaborating with our engineers in a way that we never were before. You know, product and design and, and and the development teams are like working together and they feel way more kind of plugged in and included in the process and the morale is up. Like stuff like that has been really awesome to hear. Have you had any teams give it a shot and say, yeah, it's just not for us? <laughs> I haven't heard about it if they have. They probably know. wouldn't tell you, right? <laughs> I've had, um, <laughs> it's interesting. It does expose uh, different weaknesses or sort of highlights the areas where people are struggling, you know? Um, so there, there's been folks who've reached out and say, this has alerted us to quality problems that we didn't know we had in terms of like performance of the programmers. There's other, other teams that have said, you know, we sort of unlocked the potential of our programmers now and everyone's killing it, you know, in a way they weren't before. Other people, um, it, it starts to reveal issues on the leadership side where it's like oh we we tried shape up but we were having a hard time getting everybody on the sort of at the betting table to to align with each other you know and then you also yeah. see the opposite where people say like finally we feel like we're steering the the we're steering the the company instead of just asking for stuff and crossing our fingers and hoping it gets done eventually you know so it's it it it, it in a way it mirrors what's working and what's not working in the org structure Hmm. Yeah, you get to see relationally who's who's missing from the table, so to speak, even. Yeah, and because ShapeUp kind of integrates in so many ways, you know, it integrates design and development inside the cycle. It integrates, like, the leadership at the betting table so that they're actually paying attention to, to like, how are we going to spend our time next, you know? It, it yeah. creates all those opportunities for people to look around and say, okay, how are we actually working together and where are we on the same page and where are we not? Has it stayed pretty static in terms of the content or have you gotten to evolve the idea a bit more because of 
it being out there and it's had some cycles itself. There was one round of additions that I made that were fairly small, but you know, like the same questions kept coming up. Like in the very first version, people kept writing and saying, well, what about bugs? And what about like tiny little changes? How do you deal with that? So I added a small section for that. The one thing that really keeps coming up is how do you apply this on a new product or uh, you know, like a new company that's building a new thing? Because the the all of the the concepts kind of get introduced in the context of we've got a product we've got customers and now we're making calls about kind of what to do next and we want to continually ship improvements on time to that to that product yeah and then the question right. comes up you know like hey is about to come out right the new email app that uh that that we've been working on here at Basecamp and uh that uh people have been saying like did you use shape up for hey and the answer is absolutely. But the thing is that there's some there's some sort of stages of work in a new product where the 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 straight up kind of shape up method doesn't apply, actually. And I wrote like a small appendix on this, but actually I found that I needed to expand on it when I talk to people. Um, people need more detail yeah. on that. And so we're actually working on a print version now. And I think we're very likely to have a new section in there that really spells this out. Because uh, I've talked through it enough now that I understand it. Um, and I want to be able to spell that out a little bit better f- for the next version that comes out. Is what you brought in, I'm uh, speculating here, is it kind of tying in shape up into, say, customer development and revenue growth? Or is it, what is it sort of missing in terms of like a new product? Yeah. And what are the facets there that are different from an existing team? Like you kind of know your revenue stream or like your product actually makes money or it has fit. Oh, that's and a, where are you? That's a good question. You know what I mean? Like what facets are different with a new product? Yeah. Uh, shape up is, is, is all about, um, when we, when we already have a strategic idea of what we think we want to do, how do we turn that into a project that people can actually execute on where everybody's clear on what we're going to, what we're going to do next. And the team is going to be successful building it and the team is going to make kind of more decisions about the details you know and they're going to they're going to have those guardrails and they're going to they're going to be successful getting the thing done on time so it's it's shaping is really about like we know what we want to do but we can't just go tell a team hey go figure it out we need to work out the outlines and the guardrails of what this thing is and what it isn't in order to give it to a team and kind of make that handoff really successful so Already, even just kind of in the traditional sort of doing shaping for a product that is already up and running, uh, we aren't really addressing those kind of more open strategy questions, you know, Mm. about what to shape. That's something that the book deliberately doesn't get into because that's a whole nother book. Um, And it's a fascinating subject. And it's something I've been really thinking a lot about and working a lot with lately because I'm like, I'm working on a lot of new projects for BC4 right now, a very, very early version of the next version of Basecamp. Um, so that's been at the top of my mind. What's what's different about working on a new product versus an existing product is that even if you take the strategy piece out of it and you take the all the questions about revenue and business model and, and the stuff that you raised, even if you take all of that out of it, until you have something that's standing you know, where like the the key pieces of functionality are built and they're running in code and, and that, that architecture is there. Like before you have that, it's just way too open-ended. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you, you know, like the first commits to a totally new piece of software, you know how you just end up throwing all that stuff away. Like yeah, yeah. You, you, you totally change the schema. You, you, you significantly change certain model relationships things that you even stupid like stuff that you think is a one-to-one becomes a one-to-many like there's fundamental things in the architecture that you have to figure out and what happens is when you're doing completely new product there's just so much scrap that if you try and and delegate it away to a team you know what i mean like you're going to find out in week one like oh wait a minute that's not the right way that's not what we want you know so there's this phase that we call the R&D phase that comes before the production phase. The production phase is where I've got the architecture there. The main pieces of like how this thing hangs together 
in terms of the schema, the model, the key functions, those things are all there. It's like the pillars are there, you know? And now it's more about like, how do we fill in all the details and all the extra functionality that we want? But those load-bearing pillars, they have to be there before you can delegate projects to other people, you know? Or or yeah. kind of even to yourself, if you're a really small team, to make that promise to yourself of like, I'm gonna build this feature next and I'm sure that I'm gonna be able to get to the end of it and it's gonna be done the way that I think it's gonna be from the beginning. Like you can't just right. do that if it's totally open-ended. So in the R&D phase, the first phase of a new product, we actually have to mix shaping and building together into a blurry mix. So we're not gonna say upfront, this is what we're gonna do and then give it to somebody else and they go do it because we don't know how it's gonna yeah. hang. We're, we don't know how it's gonna pan out yet. It's just too early. So what we usually do is we'll have the more senior people, you know, like David will often have his, he'll be hands-on. You know, David's our you know, co-founder and CTO. He's, he's gonna have his hands in the actual code for the first couple features because those tentpole things are gonna define the architecture for the whole product where everything else is gonna fill in. And he's gonna be doing, he calls them, uh, I think also this goes back to pragmatic programmers, the notion of a tracer bullet, you know? It's yeah. like, mm. I'm firing, it's like I'm firing to learn, you know? I'm, I'm gonna fire and then aim and then fire and then aim. It's not just right. like aim and then fire. So he'll be really involved. And then and then Jason, or it's like in the case of, hey, uh, we had another designer, Jonas, who's one of our more senior designers, who was working basically in tandem with Jason and David. And the three of them were building a little bit and then throwing it out and then building a little bit and throwing it out and trying this and trying that. And they did that for a few cycles. So there wasn't any clear shaping other than like, this is kind of what we think we want to pursue. There was an appetite in the sense of like, we're going to spend six weeks exploring this area, but we don't really know what's going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than straight shape up, right? But then what yeah. happens is, well, especially R and D, it's like you're, you're almost exploring anyways with R and D. You're you're kind of expecting to throw things away. You're not expecting to uh, have rigidity in your process. Exactly. You're, you're expecting free flow. You want you kind of want no boundaries in a way. Exactly. Because that's what enables the creativity. But what happens is, uh, a lot of times people aren't really conscious and deliberate about the fact that, like, wait a minute, I'm in a different mode here. I'm in an exploratory mode, so I have to use a different process and I have to set different yeah. expectations and we actually have to work differently together to get through this phase, you know? So so that R&D mode, the design and the programming are happening together, intensely collaborative, and we're not doing this upfront design where we're like, this is what it's gonna be and then delegating it out because we, we, just, we just can't see far enough. We just can't see it yet. But then what happens is after like, I don't know, maybe sometimes two, sometimes three cycles of that, the core pieces are gonna get figured out. And the, the, the couple tentpole features and architectural decisions are gonna get laid down. And, and David likes to say pouring concrete. You know, there's that part of the app Right. That it's like, we're never going to change this. This is the concrete. Like, we're not mm -hmm. going to bust this up and like refactor this or, or change this because this is the stuff that makes everything else hang together. Once that stuff is figured out, now you've got the borders and the walls and the boundaries to fill in a million other features, you know? Because mm -hmm. you know yeah. kind of what they plug into. And that's where you can flip into straight up shape up. We're like we're gonna shape. Straight up shape. We're gonna look at straight up shape, straight up shape up. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna define up front like what this is gonna be. We're gonna define it at the right level of abstraction, not too much detail, but also not too fuzzy. And then we're gonna give this to a team. They're gonna completely take responsibility for it, and they're gonna figure out how to execute it within the boundaries of what we defined. Like you can get into that loop then, which is sort of the main subject of the book, after you have that basic architecture in place. Yeah. I like the the metaphors in here. You know, pouring concrete, that's foundation, right? You got some rebar in there, you got the foundation. Yep. You don't put a house on what, just gravel and sand. You you put on right. a foundation that's locked. It's it's specced to the room sizes. If the foundation isn't there, you're not putting beams on it to start building a house. Yeah, and think that's think what, about remodeling your house. Is, house. If you're gonna right. remodel a house, you're not just gonna move any wall. 
You know what I mean? There's certain yeah. things about that house that are right. not going to change, right? Load bearing. Exactly. And then there's there's areas where, you know, you and, and there's a difference between uh, adding an extension or moving a wall, you know, to create different space versus moving furniture around versus painting. There's all these sort of different different levels of change that can happen, but you've got to be really deliberate and conscious of what are the load bearing parts of the app that aren't going to change. And then, because you, you end up making a lot of trade-offs around those when it comes to even how you build different features in the future. Because it's like, look, we could do that if we wanted to bust the concrete, but we're not going to bust the concrete. So what are our other options? Yeah. Related anecdote. So my brother and sister are building a house right now and the, not the builder, but what's the name of the person that comes beforehand and lays it all out? There's a company, what are they, Survey. I think it's a survey company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. whoever flagged the actual location for the house flagged it off by like 15 feet. And then the builder came and dug a hole and then they poured a foundation and then they realized we put it in the wrong place. Oh, man. And at that point, it's very expensive to fix that problem. So you got to get your foundation right. And uh, you know, side note, they came to my brother and sister and said, hey, can we just like give you a discount and leave the house there? And they said, nope, that's not where the house was supposed to go. So you're going to need to tear out all the concrete, dig a new hole, and put the foundation in where it's supposed to go. It's just painful. So painful. And I think it was painful for the survey company who has you know general liability for a situation like these, but probably very painful for the fella or woman who did that, who may have lost their job. Huge cost. Anyways, I've been thinking about that as you describe this, because you got to get your foundation right. When you build a house, you build a building, you can see the concrete there. You can see the, you can see the framework, right? You can see all that and you can say, okay, the foundation's poured. We have a cornerstone. It's not in the wrong place. It's looking good. Let's build the rest of the house. With software, it's not so obvious. Is there just like an intuition when, you know, does the CTO come and say, okay, we're, we're done pouring concrete. How do you know when it's time to switch off from, R&D slash laying foundation to straight up shape up, is it just intuition? Or are there like obvious moments when you can say, yep, it's time to go to the normal way? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, as far as I can see, it's a mix. There is some, there is art to it, um, but there is science to it as well because at the end of the day, it's a question of interdependencies. You know, um, if you look at the house story, it's a question of dependencies. You have a point where all the dependencies point down to the same root, you know, which is like, where's that, where's that concrete foundation? We all need this one thing. You know, they, yeah, everything else needs that thing. So if you think of it in terms of, de- of a dependency graph, you mm-hmm. know, you can see that structure. Yeah, and uh, when we look at software, of course, if you look at it from far away, it's just a hairball of dependencies all over the place, you know? Right. But if you if you look at the software in terms of what does it do for users and what does it do for customers, there are, you can segment in terms of primary functions and secondary functions. So, for example, Basecamp has a feature to... Um, to, to tweak whether or not you get your notifications via email or you just get them in app, right? It's not a primary feature of Basecamp. People don't buy Basecamp because they're gonna go change a notification setting, right? The primary features of Basecamp have to do with um, enabling people to know the same information that used to be scattered in different places. So for example, the way that that a group of people can all access the same to-do list and see the same thing uh, is, 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 is a primary function of Basecamp. Or, or the fact that you can post a message and a predefined group of people is all gonna get notified of that message. And that message is, is, is gonna be accessible within this sort of accessibility sphere that these people are all part of. That's super fundamental, right? any any feature we add to a, let's say a base camp project is going to depend on that mechanism of like who can see what in a project and what is a project 
you know, as a collection of data with sort of access rules around it. That's really the core. So David designed a model that's part of Basecamp 3, which is what we call bucket access. Bucket is the abstraction uh, of a project, and access is the way that we relate users to buckets. And there's some serious concrete there because uh, we've made certain trade-offs early on in the design that simplified the design for the use cases we cared about that as a consequence cut off all kinds of other options. So for example, access in Basecamp is all based on the assumption that everybody sees the same thing. And anytime you want to make a custom rule that like this person on this project can see this, but this person can't, you 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 completely like run your face up against the it's like you're grinding your nose against the grain of right. of the concrete like it does not want you to do that <laughs> you know and uh and that's the kind of thing where like if we wanted to have finer grain permissions of who can see what within a project we would have to significantly rethink that and it's not um it goes back to just a dependency analysis. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Of of if you look at the graph of what depends on what, like project, the, what is a project and what is access, and how do we define that in terms of the model and the code? That's really low in the system. That's a great way of looking at it. I don't want to put my face to the foundation either. That's, that's, <laughs> that's not good. You but you know that this, feeling it's really going to hurt. Yeah. Is that feeling yeah, like no. when you're when sometimes when you're adding new functionality or or, or doing a refactoring or, or changing the way something works, you're just kind of like flying along, you know? And it's like everything kind of is coming for free because you're you're mm-hmm. leveraging all those dependencies that are underneath you, and then and then all of a sudden you want to change something and it's like. It's like smack, like you just you right. just hit the wall and you're like, oh man, like I would have to tear up so much stuff if I want to change this. Let me throw something out to at you then. If it's a, a different angle, maybe it's not as painful as it should be. Maybe it's a velvet rope. You ever hear this concept where you know the kind of customer you want? So this foundation is like, if you want to use Basecamp, you have these kind of desires from the software you're trying to use for the purpose mm. of Basecamp, right? So rather than that being a painful thing, sure, you're hitting your face against the ground trying to do things the app shouldn't do, but maybe it's a velvet rope in the fact that it defines your customer base. Yeah, so these are very different types of risks, and I would frame this in terms of risk. So the thing is, somebody comes up with an idea, and somebody wants to dedicate time and and people to working on something, and how is this going to blow up on us, you know? And Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole thing about the concrete is that um, if we send somebody down a road where the only way that they're going to succeed is if they have to rip up concrete, the scope is going to blow up exponentially on them. Yeah. Just in terms of work. Because if you start to, if you pull on that string, you're going to pull the whole rest of the app with you because of the dependency tree, right? So right. that that's the kind of risk of like, we want to do it but if we try and pursue it, it's going to blow up in our faces because of the technical reasons. The I think the velvet rope case that you're pointing out is really important too, but it's a very different type of risk. Yeah, It's not a risk that, that the team is going to run into a scope explosion. The risk is that they're going to successfully ship it, and then we're going to end up in a, in a market position that we didn't, that we didn't want to be in. Right, serving right. people that we didn't intend to serve, or getting feedback that doesn't relate to the sort of core of how we make money, or or, or that kind of a thing. Right, it, you know that kind of that foundation is sort of uh, the DNA of of Basecamp, right? Yeah, yeah. Like so if you I would, I would that, say you're faced against the ground as a developer trying to change things, but as a product, it's your velvet rope. It defines it defines who you want to let in essentially because if you can't agree that everybody should see the same thing then you don't use basecamp yeah i would i would locate those kind of in different parts of the company then the, yeah, the boundary development. the boundary of what you can and cannot change uh, in terms of the the code you know that's something that's understood um, among the technical team and the boundary of what we should and should not change on the you know we we sort of can talk about supply side and demand side, right? The thing about like what code not to change is the supply side boundary of don't touch that and take that as a constraint on any projects you come up with. And the 
the thing about sort of what projects to pursue, the sort of velvet rope thing, that's more of a demand side thing that's coming at a different, that's coming more from the design side and it's coming more from the from the shaping side of things. So I, I'm not a programmer. Um, I'm working on what may become BC4 right now. And uh, a lot of that is, I'm, I'm totally in velvet rope land <laughs> right now, you know, like <laughs> there's things that I, where we could do that we might want to do. Um, and I always have to think about, are those the right things for our customers and are they relevant for customers and that kind of a thing? And, and do they keep us, you know, do, are we going to continue to serve the people that we want to serve by, by doing this? Um, but then, uh, if I pass the velvet rope check, I still have to do the concrete test afterward because it might be something that's totally kosher as far as the market position but it may not be a feasible change in terms of the way that the that the that the code is structured you know what i mean so i've got mm-hmm. that sort of second layer then of okay i've got to do some due diligence and talk to talk to david or talk to jeff and say like here's this thing that i think i think we should do is this consistent with the architecture we have or not and yeah. um, and can we do like a little spike? So there was a there was a feature I came up with, which was a pretty substantial kind of new weird thing um, that we've never done before. And I came to a point where I felt really confident from the demand side, but from the supply side, I had just no idea if it was feasible or not. And I didn't want to take this thing all the way to the betting table and then have have this sort of rushed eleventh hour conversation before a cycle starts and be like, eh there's sort of too many unknowns in terms of building that. So, so it just sort of gets, gets kicked off the table. You know, I wanted to sort of play more defense than that. So I reached out to Jeff, who's one of our most senior programmers here and said, Hey man, like, this is what I'm thinking about doing. These are my assumptions about how the existing system works. Do you think this is consistent and, and conformable to the existing system? And he said, you know, I think I think it looks reasonable. Let me take a swing at it. And he did a three-hour spike, just taking the existing model objects that we had and seeing if they would sort of twist and bend to do this thing. And he came out of it with like a little, you know, a little bit of code in some uh, in a in some little uh, what are they called? Like those things in Git that like don't belong to anything. They kind of just hang on their own. Um, anyway, I don't remember what they're called, but they're like these little sort of throwaway pieces of code that you can just. Uh, a branch? Uh, no, it's not a branch. It's like it's like not part of the Basecamp repo. It's just kind of like, a, a, God, what are those things called? Um, it's like a free floating piece of code that you can embed somewhere. Um, Module. Anyway, no, it's like a <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> it's not part. Of, <laughs> it's, we'll just keep it's guessing. Not, it's not part of a software project. It's not part of a repo. It's like this uh, free. It's like this like stashy kind of a thing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's going to drive me crazy. I'm going to end up looking up, like, what is this thing called? We'll put it in the show notes. You'll figure it out. <laughs> anyway. Have to come um, what's it called? It's like a little throwaway, like, scrap of a thing that you can that you can, uh, that you you can can make in GitHub anyway. Um, anyway, there's just this, li- a this little... A gist. That's it. It's there a you gist. Go. Yes. Good job, dude. <sighs> we have a winner. So like satisfying. The tail on the donkey. Just keep okay. guessing. <laughs> jargon until I get one. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure we we used your listeners' time very valuable, you know, yeah. very, very well in the last whatever Thanks ten for minutes that with was. Us. Okay. Anyway, um, no, but he he then he he can just throw a little bit of code back together and say, hey, look, like here's a proof of concept. Yes, this is viable. We'll use the bucket model like this, and actually, we already delegate this over here, and it quacks like it should, so it's going to work. And and then and then I put that back into my pitch, and now like I've passed the velvet rope test, and I've passed the concrete test. And I like this velvet rope test being in there. Yeah. So that's <laughs> is it a real thing? Or did we just make this it, up on the fly? That's how these things happen, man. You know, I like everything it. comes out of conversation. I love it. You know, that's right. The only reason actually that we even got to the word shaping was because I was giving a talk somewhere and I was with my friend and mentor, Bob Mesta, and we were trying to talk about hill charts. And this, the group was just like staring at us like we were talking, uh, like we were just speaking Greek or something. And what we realized was that we couldn't talk about hill charts because there was this other thing that they hadn't that they weren't doing which was they weren't they weren't what we now call shaping and and we were like struggling to reach for the word standing in front of this group of 150 people in a room 
And then Bob all of a sudden is like, no, but you gotta, you have to shape the work first. You have to have a sense of like, what is this piece of work that I'm trying to do, you Mm -hmm. know? And that's actually, that's where we get language from, I think, is from being in the moment where we, where we need it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So one last question here on this front, you talk about BC4, these major versions of Basecamp. And I just, on a technical sense, are these major versions an opportunity to, you know, add another wing to the mansion, pour some new concrete, or are they mostly remodels of the code base? Like, are you pouring new things? Are you remodeling how to fit inside of the current architecture? So that's case by case. So far, when we when we went from BC1 to BC2 and to BC3, every one of those involved uh, new concrete. And uh, we actually built those as completely new projects from scratch and then, and then r- r- ran them and sold them in parallel to the old version. So mm. B- B- BC, BC1 and 2 um, right now are separate code bases running on separate servers with separate customers. Okay. And um, that allowed us to make uh, drastic changes to the underlying architecture yeah. without disrupting anybody. And, um, but the only reason that we did that was because we had ideas that weren't accessible in the space provided by the existing architecture. So if we could have just ran on the old architecture, we would have for sure. Uh, but there were things that we wanted to do that we just couldn't get there from here. And it's like, man, like, look, we've got a new, I I think at the time we were using the, we were calling it like the chassis, you know, like we need a different chassis for this. Um, mm. kind of borrowing from, I think, automobile industry on that one. Yeah. And um, so that's a big, that's a huge part of it is what are we trying to do? And does the thing that we're trying to do actually require a new chassis or not, right? And how valuable is it? Is it so valuable that we're willing to do this crazy thing of, of pouring new concrete and building a new chassis? That was true for two and three. Actually, we don't believe that that's true for four as of where we are right now. Th- the... Uh, David recently shared this new pattern called delegatable type, and uh, it's at the core of BC3. So I mentioned that we've got um, you know this thing called a bucket, which is an abstraction of a of a thing that people have access to, mm-hmm. and a bucket is is a team, it's a project, it's the HQ, it's a circle of of people who are all on the same pr- uh, ping, which is like a direct message. There's a bunch of different things that are buckets because they have access. And, but the way that's implemented is that you have a bucket, which actually is just basically an ID and a way to relate the, 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 the users to this thing. It's just mm-hmm. kind of a nexus of relationships, but it has no content. And the actual content, like the name of the project and the description of the project and stuff like that, that actually is, a, is on a, what's called a bucket of bowl. So a bucket has a bucket of bowl. And the mm-hmm. bucket of bowl is, is actually an immutable thing. Um, that uh, that is kind of the value of the bucket, and right, the uh, object and, reference. And, and we use the the same pattern for every piece of data that that lives inside of a project. I mean, everything from a comment to a to do to uh, to, uh, to everything is is a, is what's called a recording. And a recording is the association between a piece of data and a bucket. And then a recording has a recordable which is an immutable throwaway thing. So, which also, by the way, gives us like stuff like versioning for free. Because mm-hmm. if you make a new version of, let's say a document, the document is a recording in its sense of it has a, uh, it sits on a tree somewhere. Um, but the document as a sort of blob of, 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 of stuff or of value, I mean, not a blob in the sense of a binary, but you know, like a, right. that content of that, of that document is actually a recordable not a recording. And then if you, if you make a new version of a document, we actually uh, push down that old recordable and stick a new recordable in as the value of that thing. And it's got all kinds of awesome properties. And anyway, this, this is the kind of stuff that, got, that, that David figured out for BC3. And um, the architecture has just been awesome. Like it's, it's, this has never happened before in our, what is it now, 17 year history since since we started working on bc on 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 basecamp classic the first one 
there's never been a time where we were like a few years into the future from one of from a from a product and looked back at the code and thought this code is awesome we love this <laughs> you know what i mean and that's that's what that's where we're at like we look at the code for bc3 and we're like this is awesome like oh, we love this 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 continues to work and we and it's 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 beautiful and it's enabling and it's spacious and it's just the right the right load bearing structures are in the right points. And we still feel like we have all the degrees of freedom that we want, you know, which is just an mm-hmm. awesome place to be. And then we look at the things that we want to do that seem hard or, or maybe divergent, you know, in BC4 and, and none of them are running into conflict with this architecture. So we're, we're, we're heading down a path right now for BC4 where it actually, we think it's going to be the first major new version we've ever done that um that completely um stays on the same platform and 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 the existing customers will actually get all the changes how much time does your team spend building and maintaining internal tooling i'm talking about those behind the scenes apps the ones no one else sees the s3 uploader you built last year for the marketing team that quick Firebase admin panel that lets you monitor key KPIs. Maybe even the tool your data science team hacked together so they could provide custom ad spend analytics. Now these are tools you need, so you build them, and that makes sense. But the question is, could you have built them in less time, with less effort, and less overhead and maintenance required? And the answer to that question is, yes. That's where Retool comes in. Rohan Chopra, engineering director at DoorDash, has this to say about Retool, quote, The tools we've been able to quickly build with Retool have allowed us to empower and scale our local operators, all while reducing the dependency on engineering, end quote. Now, the internal tooling process at DoorDash was bogged down with manual data entry, missed handoffs, and long turnaround times. And after integrating Retool, DoorDash was able to cut the engineering time required to build tools by a factor of 10x and eliminate the error-prone manual processes that plague their workflows. They were able to empower backend engineers who wouldn't otherwise be able to build front ends from scratch, And these engineers were able to build fully functional apps in Retool in hours, not days or weeks. Your next step is to try it free at retool.com slash changelog. Again, retool.com slash changelog. I came across this word in your Twitter recently, longitudinally. You said good design requires thinking longitudinally. Now that's a hard word to even say, let alone grok what it means. So where's your headspace with this? Uh, so this is um, this is something that I'm just starting to learn how to talk about. And uh, I mentioned when we were when we were off, you know, when the mics were off earlier that a lot of the stuff that I've worked on has been something that I start thinking about and then 10 years later I understand it or, or, or five years later it's, it finally clicks. And and I'm in a phase kind of like that right now. There's, there's a huge difference between looking at a slice of data as a snapshot, as a space-like snapshot and just saying, look, we surveyed customers and 20% say this and 30% say that or or something like that. And and taking the N of one, looking at one individual case, but playing it out through time and say like, if I want to understand what to design, I need to understand actually cause and effect. Like mm. what happened? And then why did something else need to happen? And then how do I cause that to happen by putting a mechanism in place? You know, so it's really the whole business of, of design and engineering is following one thread through time for one person and making that thing do what it's supposed to do functionally. And mm-hmm. is that where personas come from? Like, is that what you mean by one person? Like persona? Personas are 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 a good example of a bad thing. I mean, are there okay. are there a, they're, I mean they're they're bad. They're a, <laughs> a bad example of a good thing. Uh, no, they're they're no, they're they're, they're, bad, bad they're, bad they're bad and they're bad and they're bad. They're <laughs> it, you're you're saying uh, you you're you're blurring together a whole bunch of this comes back to and I, I, like I said I'm just learning how to talk about this but it comes back to space versus time a persona is space like it's saying 
these attributes are all sitting together in a clump. You know, 30 years old, professional, likes right. to eat sushi or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just long walks on the beach. It's it's a snapshot and it's just a clump of attributes. There's no time in there. There's no dynamics in there. There's no movement in there. So rather than knowing that I've got like 30% of customers like to eat pizza, you know, or whatever, uh, what I want to know is uh, when one person is in the situation that I'm designing for, what needs to happen next? Mm-hmm. You feel you feel that like rotation in your mind of like, it's like a 90 degree turn from from like looking at a whole bunch of attributes that are frozen to following a path forward down a vector. Mm. And that's a huge shift. So when we talk about longitudinal, we talk about following individuals over time. And uh, it's, a, it's a big mindset thing. Now, of course, there is a place for saying 30% is like this and 20% is like that, but it's not the place that tells you how to make the right thing and how to make it work. You know, so if if I identify that there's a specific person that I can I can kind of be when I'm designing, you know, and say when I'm in that situation, it's not about it's not about their age or their preferences. It's about like when like I always use go back to the Snickers story as the perfect example. Like when when I when I miss a meal and my energy is getting low and I have to get going, I have to keep going. What's a way that I can quickly refill my replenish my energy? I'll grab a Snickers, hump, 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 and eat it, and I'm done. And I'm and, and I'm and I'm back to what I'm doing. That yeah. is Joe that Pesci. that is a that is a that is a thread through time to understand that right. Mm-hmm. And if you if you take that thread through time, you get all kinds of design requirements out of that. Of of what what should the melting point of the chocolate be? Right. If you if you're making something that you're going to sit back and enjoy as like an emotional recovery, that that is is more like an ice cream. Then this thing can melt in your mouth and be and 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 you can swirl it around with your tongue and it can take ten yeah. minutes to to be finished. But that can't happen if you're supposed to just bite it and swallow it and move on. Right. So there's there's design requirements that affect the composition of the ingredients and 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 everything from from looking at it that way. And or you're in a situation where you're with a buddy who also has the same issue and you need to share one. That's why they have the Snicker two pack. Totally right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they needed, the design requirement was this person has this situation in time with other people sometimes, and and then so he's the, got sh- that person's got to share. That reminds me of a great Mitch Hedberg joke, which is I like Twix unless I'm with four or more people. Because <laughs> <laughs> who wants to share? Come on, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a a friend a friend, a friend of mine offered me a frozen banana, and I said no. But then I thought. I might like a regular banana later, so exactly. yeah. So I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> but well, anyway, just do my uh, all day. No, but then the thing uh, well, is I like that the idea of time though affecting this because that does it's situational. Yeah, it's not. See, no, then you my can age my gender, you, my attributes. It's you can use the attributes then to scale the situational thing that you're designing for. So you can say, how often does that situation come up, right? Yeah, and it may be that there are some demographics that bound this sort of scale of that, you know? Like if, if, it's, if it's too specific of a situation and it's only gonna happen to a certain number of people, then of course that's relevant to know. So there is a place for that, for that sort of space-like snapshot of attributes. But the thing is that, that, that what we could call the ensemble view or that sort of like averaging out view, just blurring everything together into 20% this and 30% that, that doesn't help you make design decisions and it doesn't help you make engineering decisions, but it's kind of the default place that our brains go too often, mm. you know, as like, how do I answer a question? Well, what, what's, what's, what's the majority, you know? And, mm-hmm. and, and it's about making this mental flip of N of one and then following that functionality through time and thinking of it more in terms of individual threads of cause and effect. That's the kind of headspace that we need to be in to, to make yeah. a design decision. Seems like a design decision needs to be. I mean, you need to have a vision, and a vision that is an N of one is de facto short sighted, right? Like there's a myopic, like single point in time that you're designing for. And it's difficult to then take that perspective and design something that has long, you know, historic implications or long lasting implications. I may be thinking about it slightly different than you are because it seems like you're talking about longitudinal in the small. 
Like, uh, yeah, longitudinal is necessarily in the small because I can't understand. I can't blur ten people together and then understand anything in terms right, of but the, the same cause person over ten. The same person over ten weeks. There's a there's a really great um, piece of 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 work by this uh, this fellow Ole Peters. He's a friend of mine, and uh, I, I started following his work. And he's he's kind of redoing uh, economics, kind of on a new foundation. And he's using a, a concept called ergodicity from physics. And uh, he mm. actually wrote a, a, a paper on it that first got it kicked off with Murray Gelman, who was like, I mean, he's this is the guy who discovered the quark. So I mean, like, he's he's in good company, yeah. you know. Wow. And uh, yeah. and the whole notion is that if you if you if you take a whole bunch of gamblers at a casino and you average out their their winnings, uh, a few huge winners are going to to throw the average. Sure. And you're going to get the mistaken impression that uh, that gambling has a certain you're gonna you're gonna value the risk at a certain level based on looking at that average, right? But if you if you follow an individual gambler, what you'll see is that they keep they keep getting they keep going bust. Mostly. They keep yeah. going bust over and over and over again. So the story of of what you see when you look when you average over a bunch of people is very different than the story that happens when you follow people one by one through time. Mm. So that's when we talk about n of one and we say longitudinally, it means we we pull apart every thread, every every person we pull apart as an individual and we follow them one by one through time to see what happens through time for that one person. And that's where the insight comes from. I was scratching my head a few weeks ago working on this this new concept I have for how to do access in in BC four, um, how to sort of assign what 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 role somebody is playing in terms of their responsibility on a project. Like, are they the person who's supposed to be doing the project, or do they just have access to see it, or this kind of a thing? And I was kind of spinning my head, like trying to think through all these different cases. And I looked at some data about you know how what percentage of projects have what percentage of people from the company on them and how, what percentage of those people are active on the project and blah, blah, blah. Look at all this stuff and none of it is giving me any insight at all, okay? And I'm looking at like 50,000, you know, customers all overlaid mm-hmm. onto some cool graph, right? That looks very impressive and I'm learning yeah. nothing. And then I think to myself, okay, what's, what's the, how do I look at this through time? And I pull up a single project from our account and I just followed the history of events because we, we drop events every time anything happens. And mm-hmm. I looked at when the, when, who created the project, when they first invited two other people, what they posted, when they invited a few other people, and then when they invited like the whole rest of the company. And by looking at one project created by one person, all of my questions went away and I had a whole design concept mm-hmm. because I could see this, the cause and effect of like, oh, you don't invite everybody on the first day because you don't have anything for like that's ready for everybody else to see. First, you just invite the person that you're collaborating with, but then there's kind of a cover your ass factor and you invite like right. a superior who you kind of want them to know that you're doing this thing, but you're not actually working with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and then you, you, you reach a point where you, you get a few tasks done, you get a few other things done, and now you have something to announce. And now it's like, okay, I got to bring everybody else in so they can see this thing that's like done, that's ready for them to comment on, right? So... I've got like all of these dynamics of how projects evolve and w- who you invite and why and when all from just looking at a single thread and a single project. So that's that's maybe gives you a little bit of kind of the intuition behind yeah. this 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 way of thinking. Could yeah. you then do multi-threaded like that where you look at several threads in that way and come up with a larger scale kind of go back to the whole exactly. this percentage to some degree so you, you it's a wiser larger number. Exactly. So that's that's what we do um, when we do jobs to be done research. We interview ten people, and each interview is is like is like a it's like a it's like a four K movie. You know what I mean? It's like gigs and gigs of data. One interview because it's the full story of how they what they were doing before what started to go wrong, what made them think that maybe they should do something differently, how they ended up finding base camp, what they did to try it. You know what I mean? That that whole thread is like a very detailed thing, but it's an N of one. And then we do that thread 
10 times. And then what we do is after we've done the individual threads longitudinally, now we can cluster to take to, to, to get to an aggregate. But the thing is that we, we, we started longitudinally, we started with time, and then we aggregate into space. So we can say three out of these 10 were all coming at it because of this reason versus these other three were all coming because of this reason. So like these three were all new managers who were trying to lead their teams well, and they needed to know uh, who, what was assigned to who and whether they were following up on it in order to fulfill their new management responsibilities, right? Versus this other group of people um, felt like they were the, the wheels were kind of coming off and they were starting to lose control because they kind of didn't know what new information was coming in from customers or what requests were coming or what, what needed to happen next. So it's very different, you know, to say like, I know what needs to happen, but I need to lead these people well so that they follow through versus I don't even know what's going on and I need to like put everybody in one place so nothing gets slipped and we all have the same information, right? So this is the kind of thing that these, these higher level clusters come out, but the way that you go about this data collection and clustering process, it's very different if you start trying to collect uh, static data as percentages of an ensemble versus if you follow if you follow the time path and then cluster on what happens through time. The starting with the causality is is very different because your 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 ground truth is all dynamics instead of statics. So it's it's a very different world. That's fascinating. And I love how that example of you trying to decide. So in that case, when you went and looked at the single project and how it grew from one person inviting, 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 what design shook out of that? If you can describe it in words, like what was the insight that that information gave you and why did it help you produce what you ended up producing? Do you remember? Yeah, um, it gave me a few things. So, and this is still work in progress, so it's a little bit muddy, but it gave me a few things. Sure. One thing it gave me was I had an assumption going in that I thought that this was about people who are directly doing the work hands-on and people who are kind of neutral, who are sort of um, just given access for purpose of inclusion and transparency. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to yeah. give everybody else in the company, because we have this habit at, at Basecamp that we invite kind of everybody in the company to all the projects. And the whole notion is like, it's it's about inclusion. It's like, we want everyone to be able to know what's going on. Right. But the thing is that, um, when I look, when I looked at the actual thread, and I, I, I saw a contradiction immediately, which was that um, uh, the creator of the project, she invited someone who was working hands-on with her, and she invited uh, two people who weren't at all working hands-on, but who were impacted by it. So all, all of a sudden, I had this no, this 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 real data point in my face of like, oh. There's a difference between including somebody because you you want them to to feel included, which is a kind of social thing, you know, right. versus including somebody because like you need they need to know because this impacts a project that they're doing or you need to get cover from them because they're superior to you, you know, and they need to know that you want them to know that you're working on the right thing. You know what I mean? There's a huge difference there. And and that difference is going to manifest in like so. Let's say I knew that um, that one person is a, is is given access for purpose of inclusion, and another person per, person was given access because they should actually know what's going on here, right? Right. Both of those people should not get notified every time there's a new line in the chat. Those people should not get notified every time there's a new comment by default. But the the person who's impacted should maybe get like a daily notice that's like, hey here's stuff that happened on projects that you're not directly involved in, but impact you like super valuable. Do you know what I mean? Is that like, like a role thing. You said it's access. Is it, is it more like a role? Like the role they play is different than just any other role. They, they need sort of a don't bother me, but keep me informed role. Yeah. Don't bother me, but keep me informed. Exactly. You see that as, as, as very different than, than, than um, allow me in if I'm ever curious so that I don't feel excluded. Very different. Absolutely. Totally yeah. different dynamics, right? So al already, that's the first thing that popped out at me. It was like, whoa, okay, that's a that's a meaningful difference. And then the other thing that popped out at me was every project that has 50 people on it because the whole company's invited didn't have 50 people on it for its whole lifetime. 
So if we were to try and do some sort of analysis that says, what's the number of people per project? And then do like a histogram of, you know what I mean? Like what percentage of accounts have this percentage of projects, right. which this percentage of people, that's a snapshot. And that doesn't tell me about the fact that all those projects had a different number of people because they had a different stage in their in their unfolding. That's huge. Right. That's huge. You know, so that 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 just threw a whole bunch of data out the window that we might have queried and 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 interpreted in a certain way, just by looking at that one, that 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 one uh, longitudinal n of one. So how do you take that kind of thing, that kind of learning, then and apply it on all your problems? I mean, if, if it's that <laughs> if it's that revealing, you know, I mean, that's, how can you do that at scale? You, you still you, figure it out. That's it's that is how we solve problems. The reality is like. This is the thing is it's actually just how it works. If you want to understand, if you want to build anything, you have to think in terms of, you have to boil it down to being one person in one situation. You say to myself, what, what needs to happen next, right? Anytime yeah. you've ever designed a system, you always end up thinking about like, what needs to happen next? What is this? What does this function have to return? What's the consumer of this function? Do you know what I mean? Like what mm -hmm. arguments do I have to provide? All of that is actually happening through a sequence of time in order to get to the end of a chain where some outcome happens. So it's actually the normal way of thinking. It's just that when we go into a kind of research mode, we somehow forget that and throw that out. And we start looking at like 20% of the people said this, but that doesn't help us. I don't know about that. I think you want to get to your answers faster. I think you look at big data like that because you're like... How can I TLDR this data to get my aha moment? To and it doesn't work better. It's right? not and the it, way, and it doesn't. It's you don't not have the enough way. information. So this no is shortcuts. The, this is the highly detailed path. And you can you can cluster vast amounts of data this way, but no tooling is built to do it this way. None of the tooling is built around this. So it's it's fascinating, you know. So like for example, we can uh, we did a we did a jobs to be done interview once where we talked to ten customers. And literally only 10, and we got this massive amount of insight about what people were trying to get out of Basecamp and why they were going to it and what it should do for them and what it doesn't need to do and all that, right? And then- Can you back up and tell us what this job to be done is and then go back into that? Because I i don't understand that. Uh, that? Yeah, yeah. So there's, um, there's, a, uh, there's a, a, a body of work that, um, that, that traces that I learned from my mentor, Bob Mesta, and he's one of the the top main practitioners of this, and uh, and and he did worked on it in collaboration also with Clayton Christensen, who's a well known um, late uh, uh, business professor from Harvard that did that that coined the term disruption and stuff like that. So, um, and uh, jobs to be done is the whole notion of it is that um, people are 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 buying things and using things because they have a job that they're trying to accomplish. It's like I'm reaching for the hammer because I'm trying to drive the nail. Do you know what mm. I mean? And and the thing is that if we understand what people are trying to do and the context that they're in and the outcome that they seek, then we get this kind of time vector of they're trying to get from here to there and these are the bumps along the way and this is where they're struggling and then these are the things that are sort of blocking them and then those become our design requirements. So it's a way you're of giving them tools to solve their problems, essentially. And yeah, I mean, like us, especially like in the in the developer world, like we're tool makers, so we can yeah. you can really think of every product and every service as a tool to get to to accomplish something. Accomplish something. It's yeah. like it's like giving people a method, you know, to get through something that they that they couldn't do. And it's true for everything. It's true for for moving to a different house or buying a car. It's it's you don't buy the car because it's red. You don't buy the car because it has all wheel drive. You buy the car because something happened in your life that made that, that you needed to make a certain kind of progress, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what happened and where you're trying to get to is going to, to define all those requirements for you. And those requirements don't come because you're, you're 60 years old or you're 20 years old. You know, there's going to be some correlation there because of the circumstances you find yourself mm. in. But, um, there's a huge difference between I bought the car because I just got a huge promotion and I wanted to show myself that I made it versus I bought the car because um, I'm about to drive cross country to a wedding and, it, and my old car that's, that's, that's been on its last leg for the last five years is making this sound. And it's like, I, I'm not going to get stuck on the side of the road. Like it's time. I got to finally replace this thing. 
Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like very different, yeah, absolutely. very different requirements. And uh, uh, everybody who's ever, uh, you hear, if you talk to people with kids, they'll tell you that nobody, nobody's, nobody when they're 15 says, I can't wait until I get to buy a minivan. And, uh, <laughs> and, and a lot of, a lot of, on the minivan, Jared? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A lot of, a lot of people, a lot of young couples that we have, a lot of young couples who have the first kid will say like, look, we're never getting a minivan. No way. Right. And then as soon as they get the second kid, what happens? Minivan. Minivan. So convenient. Because it's, it's, it's getting them in and out of the doors. It's those sliding doors. It's, it's, you know what I mean? Like there are design requirements that until you're in the job, that you don't you value, yeah. right? But then when you're in the job, all of a sudden, boom, like I, I need this because of what I'm experiencing. So that's, um, that's the sort of general point of view of the thing. And then the way that we actually find jobs. So jobs are a, um, they're an empirical phenomenon. They exist out there in wilderness. They're wild natural phenomena. It's just stuff that happens to people based on situations they bump into because of how things are. And yeah. So the way that we, we, we don't like think of like, what's the job to be done by sitting around a conference room. We actually interrogate people who did something to get the chain of cause and effect streaming backward from that thing that they did. So somebody buys Basecamp and then my basic assumption is they didn't buy Basecamp because they rolled the dice today and said, what do I do today? And the dice came up by Basecamp. They, they bought Basecamp because something else was going on that needed to change, right? And, and so, uh, so then we say, well, what happened, right? And then you get, oh, well, I, I just hired three more people and we had more customers than before and I couldn't find the thing in the Excel sheet and then we almost missed the deliverable and I thought I got to find a better way or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And you get yeah. this unfolding through time of like what actually happened to them as a series of cause and effect, and then that that's that's where you get your requirements from. So when I talk about doing those 10 interviews, that's what these are. They are interrogations about the chain of cause and effect that led up to somebody uh, making the purchase or, or using a feature or, or something like that. And then the point was that, to come back, was that if we do that analysis, we can talk to just 10 customers and we can get three or four jobs out of that. And then the question is, well, how representative are they? And then we can yeah. do then we can do sort of quote unquote big data in the sense of yeah. uh, we can we can we can survey thousands and thousands of people because we know the right questions to ask, right? So it's it's um, a lot of this big data stuff is incredibly powerful if you're trying to do to automate a perceptual task. If you're trying to recognize fire hydrants and 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 sidewalk markings and stuff like that you know what i mean like then ai is going to help you right but if you are trying to figure out kind of who belongs in what bucket based on what they're trying to do actually what you really want is to have the big data you want is those gigabytes and gigabytes of a single interview Mm, of their story right so longitudinal big data is totally different than than what's what's the what's the opposite latitude i guess i don't know i mean you never hear that but you know this uh it's totally different type of data. It's deep and big in a different direction. And then what, what you get by doing the clustering on where was the causality similar and where was the causality different and where was the intent similar and the intent different, then you get these clusters out and now you have a few very simple questions to ask people. And you, 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 can, you can, like we did this, we put a survey on our onboarding flow and we asked people a few questions based on the job interviews to kind of bucket them. And then, then we got our percentages of like 30% of customers are in this job and 10% of customers are in that job. And that allowed us to sort of weight them, you know, in terms of our understanding of the market composition. So yeah. that's, that, that's where you get, you have big data in terms of scale, but the number of dimensions is very, very small. So I think you want, you want really high dimensions when you're, when you're doing this longitudinal stuff, when, when we do the analysis, we do 10 interviews. And then when we do the clustering, we're actually clustering on something like, uh, usually on the order of like 25 dimensions. We've literally got vectors that have 25 different dimensions in them that we're clustering on. But then once you know the jobs, then you're saying either you're here for this or you're here for that, you're here for this. You're asking people like three or four questions. So it's a, it, you're, you're vastly uh, shrinking the dimensionality of the, of the data problem. And then you're asking people simple questions and then you're getting, you're getting relatively simple answers that, that, that size it. Mm-hmm. 
What's interesting, I think, is is this aha moment that sort of surfaces from this interrogation, these these jobs. And once you find the problem you've solved for one, now you can find probably more so in your data set, but then be able to attract or or know the people that have the problem, the same problem or a similar problem. So it's easy to, one, design better product towards because you're, you're improving because you understand the problem better, but it's also easier to scale those who have the same problem that's, and that's, bring in more customers. That's the key insight is that, look, people are, everyone is so different, you know? As individuals, people are totally different from each other. But if you look at the situations people find themselves in, we all live in the same world and the world is structured the same way. And the things that we come into, like when we get hungry and we need to eat and we run out of time or when we're trying to keep track of stuff and then we lose it and then we don't know where we put it, like we all run into the same stuff all the time. You know what I mean? So the people are very different, but but the jobs are actually there's actually an amazing overlap in the things that we struggle with and the things that we try to do and the hurdles that we try to get over. All right, I got a question for you. Are you curious? Because if you're curious, I have a podcast recommendation for you. As you may know, that's one of the best ways to learn about new podcasts is by recommendation. And I might be biased towards this show because I'm a host of this show, but we produce a show called Brain Science. It's for the curious. It's exploring the human brain to better understand behavior change, habit formation, mental health, and what it means to be human. Here's a preview of episode 20 titled Navigating Perfectionism. It's not advocating don't seek perfectionism, don't seek being perfect. It's the opposite of that, which is, you know, where do you find your worth? Maybe even beyond that, how can you be more secure in who you are? You said predominant. What if you can flip that and say, well, the majority of my self-worth is derived from what I perceive as my self-worth versus allowing others to speak into that and change it? Yeah, look, everybody is wholly entitled to their own opinion of what they like and what they think is good enough or acceptable. But, you know, we're we're all mm-hmm. different. Nobody starts really in the same place. I mean, genes play a role, environment plays a role, opportunities. Like there's so many things that each individual, you know, comes to the plate with. So it is a decoupling of saying I can't solely base my self-perception on the feedback from one, just anyone, and two, how do I, to some degree, create a filter around the feedback I do get from other people? Like I always give the analogy, not that I can relate with this in any way, but if I were in the grocery store checkout line and the cashier told me about how I was doing as a mom because my kids were losing their cool as toddlers, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason. It's not to say, you know, she couldn't give me feedback, he or she, give me feedback about how I'm doing as a mom because my kids are melting down and maybe, you know, it's irritating Mm -hmm. or whatever. Or I'm not being the sort of meeting the expectation of parenting at that moment. But does this person know me? All right. To keep listening, head to changelog.com slash brain science slash 20 That will take you to the episode titled Navigating Perfectionism, where we dig deep into different aspects of perfectionism, how it's adaptive, how it works, and how it just doesn't work at all. Again, changelog.com slash brain science slash 20, or search for brain science in your favorite podcast app and subscribe. We'd love to have you as a listener. All right, before we go into this last segment, you know that we mention on the show and have mentioned in past shows how much fun we have in the breaks. Well, this last segment ended up becoming just one gigantic break. We had a lot of tangent conversations, interesting tangents, etc. And we just never got back to doing the show. And before we knew it, 45-ish minutes had passed. And Ryan was talking, we were talking, we were riffing, and we were like, should we do a show? And we were like, well, we've kind of been talking. Let's just let's just cut up everything we've just been talking about this last 45 minutes, which should have been segment three of our show, into segment three and just call it a day. It was awesome. So that's what this is. Here we go. So one one 
uh, funny software situation that I was in one time, which I thought of when you were telling your story about how somebody goes about inviting someone to base camp or, you know, kind of matriculating a project was I had a client who built some software that was for financial advisors. And it's a way to let financial advisors get to know their clients better and blah, blah, blah. It's basically a survey builder with an email tool and like send the, you know, advisor. So there's advisors and there's clients. And the advisor would sign up. You know, there's a bunch of stock surveys, like things that they recommend. Financial advisors love these questionnaires. They like live on them. And their clients don't love them. So it's a weird dichotomy. But anyways, there's like all these stock ones. And then you can send them to your clients. Like that's like the, the typical starting point. Well, this thing gets out there in the wild. And he starts getting some users. Maybe you guys are better product people than me. So maybe you would have seen this coming a mile away. But an advisor signs up for this thing. What do you think is the first thing that they do? Like they sign up as an advisor and then they have, you you sign in, there's a bunch of surveys. There's like a empty list of clients. You know, you can import your clients or whatever. Any guesses on what an advisor might do at that point? No, I'm, I'm curious to learn. Curious. So what we thought they would do is either import their list of clients or maybe type one in and send them a survey. Well, it turns out like what all of them did, which we learned very quickly through bug reports and all sorts of stuff, is they actually just entered themselves as a client uh -huh. and sent themselves one. Yep. Because they don't want to be embarrassed yep. by trying out this new, you're not going to try out a new tool on your actual client. Totally. You're going to try it out on yourself. Totally. Right? Well, the system was set up with advisors and clients. And once you're an advisor with an email address and you try to create a client with the same email address, it's okay. You can do that. But then when you send that person one, it's already signed in as the advisor. It's just, there's all sorts of things that we had to iron out to make that thing work. But it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how somebody might try the product before, like we jump straight to the you're using it step. You know, there's like the, there's a timeline there. Totally. Like people don't just start using a thing. If they did, then they would just have used it the way it was designed. It was designed to be used, assuming you've already adopted. But there's like this, which is obvious in retrospect, but like they just started sending them to themselves and they're like, it doesn't work. It's like, no, it totally works. You're using it wrong. <laughs> There's a system of, of things that the user has to go through as a series yeah. of like steps that they yeah, have right. to get through to get to the other side of this thing. And there's a, it's, it's, and there's a bunch of functions that they actually have to perform. And those map back to the anxieties that they have. So, yes. So the, 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 we, we call it an anxiety in the, in the job to be done framework of these four different forces. One of them is anxieties. And an anxiety okay. is something that you're asking yourself, well, what about, what if this happens? Or like, what's that going to be? And you need, yeah. to, you need a, a mechanism to answer that question for yourself in order to move on to the next step, right? And right. if you understand that th as the person moves through time, this is the point where this anxiety comes up then you can build a mechanism in response to that. Exactly. Yeah, we there was a there was definitely a lack of uh, just like real world thinking about how somebody might go through a process of adoption mm -hmm. and how answering that anxiety of I don't want to embarrass myself with a tool I'm only testing out in the first place. Totally. So we end up building a thing where you could just send yourself a survey right away. You know, like log in. Hey, try it out on yourself. I mean. It made more sense, but it, it was almost embarrassing launching. It was kind of a soft launch with these guys, but it was almost embarrassing when we realized we didn't understand how people were actually going to use it when they were test driving. That's that really comes back to what's exciting about this, you know, to to be named mental shift, right? Yeah, is that if if we when we have that in our minds from the beginning, we find that the the first time we start thinking about a problem. We're going to put ourselves into the driver's seat of that person in that situation. And we're not going to be asking ourselves about their demographics. We're going to be asking themselves about what, why am I here and what am I trying to do next? And what am I thinking about? And what, what do I need to get through? Mm -hmm. And then you're just asking the right questions much earlier. And if you don't know what right. the questions are, which like I mentioned, this stuff is empirical. So uh, then we, we do the research and we, which doesn't mean some big gnarly research project. It just means that you, you you talk to somebody who's gone through the pr the process before and ask them what they did step by step by step. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I'm 
curious of Ryan's uh, curiosity to psychology, like the brain, cognitive load, stuff like that. You're curious about his curiosity? Yeah, I'm just curious because, I mean, he's talking about things that require empathy and empathy leads you into psychology to some degree, or at least understanding more aspects of compassion and adding other things together. So it's to, to design is to think like some other human. So you have to have some basic form of empathy to do it well. Would you like to talk about that though, the the brain science stuff or any any brain related stuff that you're really curious about? Well, I don't I don't really see it as as having much to do with the. I mean, if you want, you can look to the brain to find some some sort of neural correlates of this stuff. But but I, I don't I don't really look to the brain as the seat of these things. Um, I I think I think it's much more about the um the the circumstance. You know, you can you can black box the brain, and uh, and look at the circumstance and and. Uh, and then you you get you get the right variables out. I mean, because um, it's it's, mm-hmm. it's a question of what level of abstraction you want to you want to deal with the world on. I think you raise a really good a good point about this thing about sort of the compassion and empathy. I think we have you know um, different uh, things that sort of drive us in terms of like what we like to work with, you know, and like where that kind of where that moment is where we do the fist pump in our own work, you know, like what's, what's that moment for you where you're like, yeah, like I, I, it all clicked together and I like achieved my goal, you know? And I think that there's a, I kind of sit in between a lot of roles, um, because I, 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 I have programming in my background, but I also do product and user facing stuff. And, um, so I, I feel like I have a little bit of both, but, um, there's a satisfaction as an engineer of like flipping the switch and then watching the the current run through and then the and then the gizmo does what it does on the other end. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. moment of like yeah. that moment of like ah oh, it, it did it did it. It like the test ran green and it worked, did what it was supposed to do and like ah oh, that's awesome, you know? Um mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. um that's one orientation. And then there's another orientation of like um there's there's a struggle somewhere in a in a life situation of like I keep losing this stuff or I I, I, uh, we're trying to accept donations at our, at our, at this nonprofit. And like the, every time we try and get people to sign up for a membership, there's like too many steps. And then they kind of like their eyes glaze over and I lose them. And then like, it never, they never follow through. And you know what I mean? Like these, these mm-hmm. sort of, I don't know what you call them. They're like the domain specific problems that come up, you know, I think you can get kind of hooked on solving those kind of things for people. Um, and it's, in essence, it's not different than getting the gizmo to work when you flip the switch, you know, because all of it is cause and effect and all of it is interdependencies and dynamics. It's just a question of sort of which domain uh, you like to play in, you know what I mean? And like where you kind of get your kicks of, of what's more fun to solve. There is an aspect of, of psychology, but I think that, again, Every time that we kind, I, I, what I find is that every time I try and dig into the psychology, I go down a rabbit hole that that doesn't help me help the person. Versus, uh, if I look at it situationally, then I can say, look, regardless, you can bracket the psychology and say, look, regardless of who you are, if you were in that situation, what would you want to do, or what would you want to happen, or what would be helpful, and uh, and that that brings everything to a level of concreteness and objectivity where uh, we can be way more productive, I think. And and we're seeing now, there's a huge wave right now where all this behavioral economic stuff is getting thrown out. Really? All this stuff about like, oh yeah, it's it's just starting, but you're gonna see it. All this stuff about like loss aversion and and all these like biases that people have, it's all BS. It's all BS because the thing was that um, these the people who did this work the behavioral economics people, they were starting with with a very artificial fabricated model of how they thought people f- made decisions, you know, like these Bayesian probabilities and stuff like that. And then when people didn't behave the way their models behaved, they said that something was wrong with the people, that they had biases. And what it turns out is that if you come up with a better model, <laughs> then they, you, you, you can actually say that the way that people behave is completely rational. And, mm. and again, Ola Peters has been doing some really fantastic work on this. Um, there's a paper yeah, on... What was, that, on, uh, what was on, the name of that area of, of economic study that you mentioned that your friend is doing? Um, so the, the new field of work that he's doing is called ergodicity economics. And it's it's a bit of a mouthful, but the thing is that it it you know it, it it draws from like I said this 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 piece of ergodic theory from physics, 
But anyway, um, his 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 body of work is 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 known as ergodicity economics, okay. and um, a huge part of it is that he's he's taken a great number of puzzles in economics or or decision making, um, and taken out the the so the so called psychological bias by using a different model, a much simpler assumption, um, and then and actually you get the you get the perfectly consistent results with with the data. Um, using it's a question of using the right model instead of saying that the people are are wrong because they don't they don't they don't match our model it's it's a new area that's really blooming right now and it's going to take a while because the the behavioral stuff really penetrated the popular consciousness mm-hmm. so a lot of people now are are aware of these things um but that's just it was a big wave with also because of this very popular book that that Kahneman and Tversky wrote you know this uh, thinking fast thinking slow and so on but now a lot of it is being discredited. So it's actually a very exciting time in that field. What they wrote in that book? Yes. Really? Yeah. See, he is into it, but he's not into it. He's he's into it enough to know he's not into it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I don't know the book or the author's names, but I do like listening to the Econ Talk podcast. I love Econ Talk, man. Right? He, he's so good. It's just yeah. one, it's like one of my favorite podcasts. He's such Me a too. fantastic interviewer. Oh, and I he's know. so... Um, I love like I, I was just listening to an episode a day like yesterday, and he I, I love how he'll just say, "Yeah, I don't agree with you." <laughs> totally, and it's so great to hear that on a podcast instead of the echo chamber where everyone is is you know what I mean like vibing on each other's opinions. Like, right, you really hear a difference in view, but with a great degree of civility and 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 it's just it's fantastic. I really that's really great. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Not to just agree oh. with you to agree, but I do agree. <laughs> well, I disagree. <laughs> we could talk econ for the last segment, but I don't know. I think Ryan might be in his own league over there because all I know is what uh, econ talk tells me, and I don't even listen. Yeah, to that. I, we actually, I I would love it if 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 they would get if they would get Ole Peters onto econ talk. That would be a great fit. Um, but I don't well, know. Well, that's was funny because I was just going to go search their archives for er- ergodicity to see if I could listen to something about it because I don't. Uh, when, I don't have uh, time to read books. When, sadly. when, no, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a really good, uh, short YouTube video that gives okay. you a very good introduction to it. There's a, there's cool. a talk that, that Ola gave that is like a really great primer and it's only, you get it in the first 10 minutes of the video, the basic idea. And, nice. uh, it's, it's a really nice intro. So I'll give you a link for that. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. I actually found out, um, you know, uh, Nassim Taleb was on, uh, was on Econ Talk, and he was he was actually telling Russ on the air to that he he has to get Ole on. So it's like nice. See, hopefully, there's some there's some connection there. Hopefully, it happens eventually. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm by no means a, a well informed, you know, right. uh, economist or anything like that. But no. I, this You're is a, kind it, of a... It, it turns out that there's just actually a lot of overlap in the theory aspect of of this stuff with with yeah. what I do. So I have a, a sort of a, a slightly deeper than armchair relationship with it. Well, yeah, I mean, especially if your designs are intended to make money or solve people's problems or influence people, you know, I mean, like you, you at least want to study human behavior at some point to have some basis. It's funny, you know, I tried to look at economics, at economics through that lens early on and just, there was nothing useful in it because it's all BS. Like the, the models of economics, have you ever known a single business person who drew a utility function to make a decision about how to run their business? Like there's just no relationship between standard economic theory and what actual people who, who create and, and act in the economy do, right. you know? Um, but yeah, it's the same reason they can't predict how the economy is going to recover. Right. Because well, they can't predict all, any of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you can assume certain things, but causality, timelines, problems, all these things we've been talking about. Exactly. Compound. But then the thing is, you need a notion, you actually do run into the notion of utility in the sense of what is valuable, what is useful, how much do people, like what, how much do people care about this thing and need it when I set a price on it? Like there is, there is some, they've got their fingers on some, on the right questions, but the models aren't there. So, Mm. so, you know, like in a way, this job to be done stuff is actually a redefinition of what utility is. Um, you know, the utility of something is, is, has to do with the, the job I'm trying to do um, and the context wrapped around that. Um, so there's, I, I, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of interesting stuff uh, brewing, uh, you know, especially around Ole's work. I definitely recommend checking that out if somebody is, has the right sort of nerd 
inclination for you know, this kind of it's a little far afield but it's mm-hmm. it's very eye opening another uh, by the way i'll mention if on the other side um there's a really accessible book that's fantastic called the end of average by todd rose mm. and the end of average actually touches on all this stuff but from totally from the other side from a completely accessible angle and uh he he really gets into detail about um uh different cases where uh, they, uh, people averaged over the uh, data of a bunch of people versus following individual pathways. And he looks at it in, um, in medicine and in schooling and in, uh, mm-hmm. a, a variety of different situations. And it's a, it's a very short and very pithy book that also is, is about this, this sort of mindset shift that we've, that we've been circling around for a while. That's a really good one. How involved are you on Hay? Is that something you want to talk about, or you've been are you off the Hay project? Is that a different team, or yeah? So um, I actually was never really involved with Hay very much, um, except for a few sort of key points. Okay. Um, Hay came up um, from Jason and David, kind of feeling like they had a, an itch of their own that they wanted to scratch, which is the mm-hmm. exact same way that Basecamp Classic, the first version, happened. There was something that they were seeing where they wanted it for themselves, and so. I didn't really have anything to contribute because they were a hundred percent driving based on what they already were seeing in their own use case of what they wanted, you know? Makes sense. Yeah. And then um, I, I did play a role where there were a couple points where um, it wasn't really clear how to distill it. Like, you know, like when you've got a million ideas for a product and then, but you have to boil it down to like, these are the three main things that it does. Right. Um, there was a point like that kind of early on where, where they pulled me in and we had a conversation that kind of helped frame what the main function of Hay is um, mm-hmm. versus the secondary functions, like what's the core. And uh, and then there was there were a couple times where I got pulled in for review because they needed sort of outside perspective. But other than that, they've they've really driven the whole thing. Right on. Uh, I'm really digging this last segment. It's it's different for us to just grab bag it, but it's been a lot of fun, Ryan. It's been. Great to catch up. So I know you got a print edition coming out sometime soon. What's the next step for that? Where can people get that? What's what's next? Yeah, so we're working on the print edition now, and it'll be kind of soon-ish. But you know, we've got some some unknowns. We have to figure out with the formatting and stuff like that. Uh, to find out when the print edition is out, you can go to basecamp.com/shapeup, and right at the top, underneath the buttons to read the book, you'll see a link that says "Join the newsletter." And if you join that, we won't send you anything other than news about about formats. So when the print edition is available, then uh, we're also going to do an ebook version, uh, and you'll get you'll get notified when those are out. I just subscribed, so I will be notified, and I can't wait. Awesome, Ryan. Thank you so much for your time. It's been uh, great catching up. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. It's been fun. Wow, what a marathon of a show. Ryan is awesome. Thank you, Ryan, for sharing all your wisdom. And thank you to you listening to this. If you're listening to this right now, if you've stuck around this long, you're a diehard fan. You're a true fan. We thank you. And a fan like you might want to help us out by sharing this show with a friend or by giving us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts. That's such a huge help, believe it or not. The best way for podcasts to get discovered is by telling your friends and doing ratings and reviews. That's the best way to do it. And of course, we always invite you to comment on this show. Pop up in your show notes and click discuss on Change Law News. We'd love to hear from you. Huge thanks to our partners who get it fastly, Linode and Rollbar. And as always, we love these beats from Breakmaster Cylinder, so give it up for Breakmaster Cylinder. And we have a master feed of all of our podcasts, all of our podcasts in one single feed. It couldn't be easier. Head to changelog.com slash master or search for Changelog Master in your favorite podcast app. You'll find us. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks, guys. It's uh, it's I, I appreciate how like you how far out you let me go. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, dude. Oh, it's so fun. We, we enjoy that. I mean, we sometimes having no real direction is direction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you just <laughs> know I'm going to go west, I mean, well, I'm going to go west. Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll get somewhere. Totally. Some of the best conversations aren't you know on rails. That yeah. being said, some of our shows are like specifically like yeah. hey, we're going to do this, 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 and other shows were like, hey, let's. Let's let it be a conversation and really let it flow the way one would naturally flow. And I don't know. I enjoy listening to those 
kind of podcast. Again, it's kind of like, uh, what's the job to be done here? Sometimes it's to educate, sometimes it's to entertain, or just to hang out with people yeah. while you're mowing the lawn or whatever, you know? Totally. If I'm trying to sell more Snickers, man, I'm going to hang out where they are all hungry, okay? Because <laughs> <laughs> hungry and need to do something else and they got no energy, so... I'm gonna find out. That, where they that's get by the way. The that's that's where Snickers got that campaign. You're not you when you're hungry. It was from doing this research. This, is that this, right? this exact this exact process is how. And before they did this research, they were actually um, in really bad shape in terms of sales. And uh, they did a massive turnaround mm-hmm. in the '90s um, by doing this. The exact one I was type thinking about. Wow. I don't remember that one, but the one I do remember is gonna be here for a while. Grab a Snickers. I like that one because <laughs> yeah, like when you're stuck somewhere yeah. and you're like, gosh darn it. Well, I mean, the advertising though for it is like, you know, because you can sort of like either put yourself in the picture of, you know, the Joe Pesci actor that is not supposed to be Joe Pesci, but acting Joe Pesci, Mm -hmm. you know, with that sort of aggravated attitude, you can, you can put yourself in that person's shoes at a given moment in your own life. And you didn't reach for stickers, but you're thinking, well, right next time I now have a new tool to reach for. (laughs) Yeah. Or the football player that becomes Betty White. Right. Yes. It's, it's because that's, they, they've, they're, they're, they're mirroring to you something right. that happens to you and saying, and they're, they're, they're wiring the light bulb for you. Oh yeah. So you say, oh, okay. When that happens, like I need this. It's the same thing that happens. Like when you go to Ikea, you know, like Ikea has all kinds of things that objectively suck about the experience, you know, like who wants to go and pack their own mm-hmm. boxes and 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 fill load their own car with a whole bunch of boxes and stuff like that like uh compared to like a premium furniture store this idea that you would like roll around a warehouse and like fill your own cart like why would that be a good user experience you know but when you look at the trade-offs that they're making ikea the re- the main job to be done of ikea is get me get this new place furnished today like i've got this one weekend and I've got to get this place set up and I've got to move on with my life mm-hmm. today, right? Yeah. So that means there's no custom ordering. There's no like waiting for your fabric choice and then having it delivered. Like you got to get it all done today. And how is it all going to fit in your car if it's not flat packed, right. you know? And how are you going to buy it all at once unless it's cheap? So like it needs to all be really cheap. So th- there, there needs to be like this cost factor of you're, you're willing to make the trade-off of loading your own cart because you get to get the whole, you get to get all the bookshelves and the desk and the kitchen and everything all set up like today, and you're going to be able to do it all in one shot. You know, it all it all holds together. And one um, more thing, and you can take the whole family. Well, yeah, and that's the other and it's thing somebody too. Somebody from fun for them. There's well, and and why is there why is there a cafe? Because it takes all day to buy everything for a new apartment. It sure can, yeah. It literally mm-hmm. takes all day to get all that stuff, and you 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 can't go away to eat because you're not done yet. So everything there's there's a deep logic to 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 the whole thing um, based on the job. 